neural philosophy is kind of at the interface between neuroscience on the one hand and those grand old questions that have worried philosophers for a long time. So the idea is that because science has developed so much and because neuroscience is really beginning to develop in rather extraordinary ways, the idea was that there would be things from neuroscience, particular kinds of discoveries, that would help us understand things about the nature of the mind. And on the assumption that our mental states and our capacity for learning and remembering, for seeing, for thinking, that all of these are functions of the physical brain, the idea really that motivated neurophilosophy was that we will understand those functions much more deeply once discoveries are made in neuroscience that bear upon them. And this has kind of turned out to be so. So let me give you an example of what in the early days kind of motivated me to think that to understand the mind, you need to understand the brain. So the discovery that really motivated me, I think, was the discovery made in California at Caltech that in human patients who were treated for epilepsy, surgically, a very remarkable result was observed. These are known as the split brain patients. So they were epileptic, but their epilepsy could not be treated by drugs. So what happened was surgeons suggested that if you separated the two cerebral hemispheres, the, le the right from the left, that this might have the good effect for the patient of controlling the seizure. So what they did was they separated the two hemispheres by, separ by cutting the nerve sheet that normally in us connects the two hemispheres and it keeps information on this side sent to information on this side and vice versa. The deeper structures were not of course split so it was really just at this upper level where the cortex connects. The result was that in a way consciousness was split. Consciousness itself, which we think of as a very special kind of mental state, was separated so that the things that the right hemisphere could see and was aware of were different from the things that the left hemisphere could see and be aware of. And one of the surgeons, Joe Bogan, tells a story of the very early post-surgical days of one of the patients. So the patient was a man who was sitting in a chair. His right hand picked up a newspaper and the left hand put it down. And the right hand picked up the newspaper and the left hand put it down. And this was, this was a transitory sort of disconnection effect, but it showed that at least for a brief time, these two hemispheres were behaving and controlling the body behavior in quite different ways. And this result made me think at the time that this was really a, a very new way of thinking about mental processes such as consciousness and strongly implied that consciousness is really a function of the physical brain itself. But since the discovery of, made by those working on uh, split brain subjects, and of course Michael Gazanica has written very extensively and very interestingly about these subjects, since that time there have been many, many other discoveries that have had an impact on how we think about the nature of learning and memory, for example. So again, an early result, which then launched a long, long and very wonderful and very rich program of research, involved, again, a human patient who, on both sides of his brain, lost certain structures related to the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is quite deep, but it sort of lives within the temporal lobe uh, on each side. And the hippocampus and related structures in this patient 
uh, were taken away. And we learned a lot from this patient, namely that the hippocampus is really, really crucial for learning new things. And we also learned then from rodent studies that the hippocampus is essential for spatial learning. And we see now, for example, in a rat, that if a rat is allowed to wander around a room, that very specific cells in the hippocampus always respond whenever it's in one place, another cell responds when it's in a different place, and so forth. And if the rat learns to navigate a maze for food, one of the things you will also see is that when the rat rests, it rehearses, and you can see this from the ele electrical activity in the hippocampus, that when the rat is resting, it rehearses or replays or replans its route through the maze. And I think it's a very striking result for two reasons. It tells us about the nature of representations, that the rat has a representation of its spatial world, which is kind of like a map. And it also tells us that the rat offline can replay or rehearse, or as you might say, can imagine its route through the spatial world. So these are the kinds of discoveries that have told us really deep and interesting things that bear upon human representation, upon human consciousness also. And I think these are the kinds of examples where neurophilosophy, that is to say philosophical questions and neuroscience questions, have really intermeshed. Of course, there have been many, many discoveries in neuroscience, and it's important to kind of realize that they happen at many different levels of organization. So there, we can think of the level of molecules as being the deepest sort of level, where we think that certain molecules can have a very important effect on learning and memory, on reward, on feelings of pleasure, on feelings of connectedness to other people. So the, the molecular level is very important, and through manipulations and experiments we can see that. But the level of the synapse, where we can see that the connecting structure between nerve cells can change, can in some cases uh, deteriorate, in some cases be pruned back, and in some cases can flourish. And we know that now that this has a really important role in the embodiment of information itself. And above the level of the synapse is the whole neuron. And many important discoveries had to be made about the nature of the neuron itself before we could really understand how the brain as a whole is organized and how the brain might solve certain kinds of problems like how to touch my nose or how to see in depth. Above the level of the neuron are circuits where groups of neurons are connected to each other and in some tasks are highly connected to each other and in other tasks less so. And part of the challenge facing neuroscience right now is how to access all of the elements in a neural circuit in order to really understand how a neural circuit can work. So how it can work so that when I ask you a question like, did you ever fall off your bicycle? you can immediately answer. How does that happen? Well, to answer those kinds of questions, we really need to understand the circuit level. But above the circuit level, there are, are levels of organization having to do with whole systems, like the whole visual system, or the whole system for smell or for taste. And these systems also have been explored in quite a lot of detail, but we don't yet have a picture that sort of puts it all together. We have fragments and really important components of the story. But there are many, many fundamental unanswered questions in neuroscience. And so that means that for really fundamental issues about the nature of the brain, um, such as precisely what governs development or why is it that as humans and probably 
rodents and other and, and primates too as they enter adolescence there is a large pruning back of synapses and the question really has been why does that happen and what is achieved in the pruning back this really extensive pruning back that we see in human adolescence and a related question is what happens if there is insufficient pruning back or if the pruning back of uh, the neuronal circuits and the structures that make up the neuronal circuits what happens if the pruning back is different from the normal case and one interesting hypothesis but let me say it's only a conjecture at this point is that it may be related to uh, schizophrenia as you know schizophrenia is um, its onset is in late adolescence and early adulthood it's not a we don't see symptoms by and large we don't see symptoms in childhood but it begins to happen a little while after this normal period where we see pruning back and so a conjecture has been that schizophrenia might be related in some way to pruning back that is either insufficient or that is disorganized or that fails to achieve the kind of streamlining that we think happens uh, in normal pruning back. So I mention that only to illustrate that there are really, really important connections between research in neuroscience and these tremendously important issues in medicine such as what is the underlying cause of schizophrenia, what might we do in order to be able to stop it, but also related questions about Alzheimer's disease, for example. But there are something like 600 diseases of the nervous system, all of them terrible, and for none of which do we have really an adequate understanding that will allow us to intervene and prevent or to cure. So I think that's a really important aspect of neuroscience. But of course, we also think that discoveries about how the brain can be so amazing, how it can, its elements can be so much slower than the elements of a computer by a factor of a thousandfold. And yet, we can do things much faster. So we know that there's a lot of parallel processing and the idea that a parallel machine with the kind of organization of nervous systems might be amazingly efficient, much more so than the kind of conventional computers that are pretty darn amazing in themselves. So there may be tremendous technological spin-offs also from neuroscience. And this is a reason that has motivated many governments uh, to invest very heavily in neuroscience, not just for health reasons, not just because the questions are scientifically so exciting, but also because it may open the door to conceptually very, very new ways of computing and doing the kinds of things that we would like machines to have the flexibility and the complexity in order to be able to do.